Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see so many of you. I hope I see as many of you tomorrow, after tonight. Now, this is a this is a complex topic, and I might be saying some things which seem strange to some people. But uh, I ask you to bear with me. I do not want to offend anyone. The idea is not to hurt anyone's feelings, but uh, we do have a message to bear, and the world is sitting on the brink. And I believe we are living in very, very serious times, and the time to be silent is over. The time to speak has come. So I will say a few things. But please bear in mind that even if you are inf offended, be offended with me. That's fine. But come again to be more offended, please. <laughs> this man is a very interesting man. And uh, he's not receiving very good press in, in Europe and elsewhere in the world. But you will have to learn to deal with his mindset because the mindset is coming to your district as well. And uh, if it hasn't come to your district to some extent, then uh, it will be made sure that it does come to your district at some stage. Now, when it comes to prophetic interpretation, I stand fully with the Protestant interpretation of prophecy. 100% behind what the Protestant interpreters and theologians said based on the evidence of Scripture and Scripture alone. Now, if you look at my history, I mean, my history is really weird. I grew up Roman Catholic, staunch Roman Catholic, became a militant atheist, returned to being a staunch Roman Catholic, only to become a staunch Protestant. That's weird. But that is the progression, and uh, today I stand with the Protestant interpretation. That does not mean that I reject Catholics. My entire family is Catholic. Well, not my entire family, half my family is Catholic. And uh, this has nothing to do with people. This has to do with ideologies. It has to do with interpreting Scripture. Now, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 13, you have an amazing prophecy. Now, 500 years ago, the Protestant interpreters didn't fully comprehend this prophecy because there were certain issues that didn't even exist in their time. But the, what they did with it was so brilliant, it's mind-boggling, that they could so accurately pinpoint the issues involved. And the entire Protestant world separated from Catholicism. Not because they didn't like their families, who were all Catholic, but because the ideology compelled them to do so. And sometimes they had to leave father and mother and brother and sister and wife and loved one for the sake of the truth that they had discovered. And that surely was hard to do, same as it is today. It's very hard to do that. So I want you to understand from the outset, this has nothing to do with people. This has to do with ideologies. And if you understand it, well, then you can make informed decisions. There is a beast described in Revelation 13 that comes out of the water, which is a conglomerate beast. It has all the components of the beasts described in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, the first kingdom to arise is the Babylonian kingdom, and it's depicted as a lion. And it is not 
up to conjecture whether it's Babylon or not. The scripture tells you it's Babylon. So you cannot choose. You cannot say it's something else. You cannot make it a uh, United, Sta uh, United Kingdom football team. You can't because the scripture says that it's Babylon. And then the next animal to arise is a bear that is raised up on one of its sides. And the next one to arise is a leopard-like beast with four heads. And the last one to arise is a terrible creature with ten horns, eventually. And Scripture tells us what these are, without making any bones about it. The second one is the Medo-Persians. The third one is the Greek Empire that was eventually split into four. And the final one is, of course, Rome. And that eventually dissipated into the ten original kingdoms that make up the European powers of the world. That is the Christian world as it is known in the world. That includes all of us sitting here today. So this beast in Revelation chapter 13 is a conglomerate. It has the head of a lion and it speaks with the mouth of the lion. So the language is Babylonian. It stands on bear's feet. Its system is Medo-Persian. It is a Mithraic system. And its body, the bulk of it, is Greek. And then it has ten horns. And there are crowns on those horns, so it rules with absolute authority. And the reformers made no bones about it that this creature according to them, represented the Roman system that was ruling in their time because the crown was on the horns. So Europe was the center stage of the final issues on the planet. But then Revelation chapter 13 goes further and describes another creature that comes up out of the earth and that these two creatures would eventually form allies and that together they would control the entire world and particularly control the mind. And propaganda is very useful for controlling the mind. And you can herd people into a collective thinking if you create the right circumstances. So this beast that came out of the water this conglomerate beast had Babylonian components and the reformers said Rome has Babylonian components because they have mother-child worship in their system. They have the worship of saints and all of these things that go along with it. And it has Medo-Persian components. The system is built up like the Roman Mitraea where man individual was the father and head of the congregation but you could have many orders. Rome is the same, it has many orders. You can be a Dominican, you can be a Jesuit, you can be a Franciscan, you can be a Carmelite, all of those issues. So the system is Medo-Persian, that's what it stands on. Its philosophy is Greek. It has the same philosophy in terms of its morality. The morality is not based on the Bible, the morality is based on natural law, which emanates from Greek philosophy. So it has a Greek philosophical issues. And then there are ten horns. And the Bible tells us that the ten horns are ten kingdoms that will arise out of the fallen Roman Empire. And it was ruling. And Daniel chapter 7 tells us that one of these powers, one of these political powers, would also be a religious power and that it would exercise authority over humanity. And the reformers picked up on this and said there's only one power that qualifies and that must be the Roman Catholic State Church, which happens to be a political entity because it has a territorial integrity, it has a political stature, and it also has a religious component. So it's a religio-political component. 
And that was the one that was more stout than the others and controlled the affairs of Europe, which is confirmed by history. And your own nation was very much involved in this conflict and you came to the aid of the Protestants on numerous occasions and the Lord is looking for the thousands generation of them that love him. He hasn't forgotten you, even though through media and who knows what all and science you have become secularized. And uh, that's just part of history. The whole Europe has become secularized. There was a time when you went out with great fervor and evangelized the world and converted the African nations and now the African nations have to come to you and convert you again. I'm sorry about that, but that's just the way it is. So this is what they said. Just to make sure, I'll give you one reformer, Wesley, who comes at the end of the process of reform. And he says, this beast is the Romish papacy as it came to a point 600 years since, stands now and will for some time longer. To this and no other power on earth agrees the whole text and every part of it in every point as we may see with utmost evidence from the propositions following. And then he gives a Bible study which says that's what Protestants believe. That's what Luther believed, that's what Melanchthon believed, that's what John Knox believed, that's what Calvin believed, that's what Spurgeon believed, that's what Cranmer believed, that's what Latimer believed. I could go on and on and on and on. That's what Isaac Newton believed, you name it. That's what the kings of Europe and the king of Denmark used to believe. Today they don't believe that anymore because they believe the doctrine of futurism. In the past they used to believe the doctrine of preterism, but that turned out to be a Greek king, so it couldn't qualify as uh, this power that came out of Rome. And futurism can't qualify either because it comes out of Rome and exists until the coming of Christ. So anyway, that's what the reformers believe. He claims the beast is a spiritually secular power opposite to the kingdom of Christ, the power not merely spiritual or ecclesiastical, not merely secular or political, but a mixture of both. The beast has a strict connotation, connection with the city of Rome. That was the reformed position. This is just history. Revelation chapter 13 verse 3 says, And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. An amazing text. Now this power that ruled Europe for 1,000, over 1,200 years, this power would receive a deadly wound. And then this wound would heal. In other words, the first damage was being done by the Protestant world. Started off with Wycliffe and then went to Johann Hus. They managed to get rid of those. Well, they didn't manage to kill Wycliffe, but they did dig up his bones and burn him afterwards. But nevertheless, that inflicted a wound, but it didn't kill it. But the political power of Rome came to an end when Napoleon confiscated the papal states and declared the political power of Rome at an end. Not the church power, the political power. So it received a mortal wound. But the scripture says it would heal. And in 1929, Rome got its political stature back when Mussolini gave them back a tiny little portion of papal states, which is one of the most, pow no, the most powerful state in the world today, whether we like to believe it or not. But the story carries on. So once they signed this historical pact and the wound started to heal, that would mean that Rome would regain its position of authority in terms of ecclesiastical authority over political authority. So the morality of the world and the belief system of the world would be prescribed again by this power. An amazing thought. Martin Luther actually said that if Christ shouldn't come soon, then the world would revert back to the position that it was in before. And 
he does not know how right he was. And power was given him over, there's a terrible little word there, it's called all, kindred, and tongues, and nations. Uh, does that include Denmark? All? Does it include South Africa? What about New Zealand? Well, what about China? Surely not China. China? All? What about Japan? Does it include that? That's what scripture says. I'm not making this up. That's what scripture says. And I'm not going to go into the details. I've done that in previous lectures. How every single nation is actually controlled by the system. That's not my aim tonight. But let's get to the second power. Revelation 13, 11. And I saw another beast, which is another political entity. Because a beast is a kingdom. Coming up out of the earth. So this wasn't where the populated nations were because the waters stand for peoples, nations, multitudes, kings. And it had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. So here was a two-pronged system. And it had lamb-like features, so it was Christian. But it spoke like the dragon. Now, unfortunately, the Bible tells us that the first power that we spoke about just now received its power from the dragon. So if I want to know how a dragon speaks, I have to go and listen to what the first one said. The first one said, if you do not do what I say, I will put you in front of the Inquisition and I will torture you to death until you finally come to your senses or die. That's what the first one said. Is the second one going to do the same? It seems incredibly unlikely, but is it possible? So it is a Christian system, no doubt. And uh, there's only one that really qualifies. If you take all the qualifications, now we don't have time to go into that, and that is the United States. So there's a brief prophetic scenario of what the reformers believed, plus the little addition of what they conjectured on. In fact, Wesley writing just before the United States became a nation, said this power cannot be far off. He should arise at any moment. Brilliant, brilliant, these interpreters of Scripture, because they loved Scripture. Verse 15 said he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Now that's an interesting text. Now the beast, we know, has been interpreted by the Reformers as Catholicism. This one would become an image of it. It would be just like it. That's what it means. Just like it. So it must become a power that enforces its morality. And if you don't go along with that morality, well then you don't have a right to exist. You need to be removed from humanity. That's an image. So it's going to be a religio-political system. That's why it has two horns. Statecraft, churchcraft. It's going to be like the first one. Church and state are going to come together. Impossible! The American Constitution forbids it. Church and state will be separate. Well, I believe scripture. It says it's going to happen. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would worship the image of the beast should be killed. You don't go along with this system. You'll have to be eliminated. There's no room for you. That's basically the same that happened in the Middle Ages. When your little nation stood up for scripture and righteousness and was willing to bear the brunt no matter what. That's what history tells us. And then eventually he will do exactly what the first beast did. And he caused all. That's a terrible word, all. Both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And no man might buy or sell, say he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I'm not going to go into the details of this prophecy. There are DVDs where you can go through it point by point and many studies on this and you can just take the reformed position and uh, you will come to similar conclusions. So this first beast, Rome, had a mark. And this mark is a mark of its ecclesial authority. 
That means it must have an authority over and above the authority of Scripture. Now what does Rome say about what its mark is? Only Rome can tell us. So we will ask Rome, what is your mark? Catholic record tells us Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that, this fact. So Rome claims that it has ecclesiastical authority even over and above the word of God. And that is its mark of authority. And its morality is dictated by natural law. And uh, Ratzinger, who was Pope Benedict, made a speech at the United Nations where he said, our morality is based on natural law. He made it quite plain. Nobody has to guess about it, which is a Greek philosophy. And it's not scriptural. And he says the fact that we have authority to change even the precepts of God shows that we have authority to rule. Just to make sure, here's another Roman Catholic source. Most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath, Saturday, to Sunday. And that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible, now this is interesting, is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings only on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. So well, let's not go into the details of the relevance of this, of why it's important. We can do that in another lecture. Just the basic facts. This is what they say, so we must take it at face value. Now let's get to the United States of America. One of the most loved presidents of all time was this man, JFK, John F. Kennedy. And John F. Kennedy was a Catholic, and you would expect this Roman Catholic to take a Catholic position, but he didn't. He took a Protestant position. And he made a speech which so irked the powers that be that maybe it led to his demise. Whether it did or not, that's not the subject of this evening. He said the following, and he said it with such pathos. He said, I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no Catholic prelate would tell the president, should he be Catholic, how to act. And no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote. Where no church or church school is granted any public funds or political preference. And where no man is denied public office merely because his religion differs from the president who might appoint him or the people who might elect him. I believe in an America that is officially neither Catholic, Protestant nor Jewish where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope, the National Council of Churches, or any other ecclesiastical source, where no religious body seeks to impose its will directly or indirectly upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials, and where religious liberty is so indivisible that an act against one church is treated as an act against all. Ah, isn't that beautiful? Freedom of conscience. You can decide what you want to believe and nobody is allowed to tell you what to believe. That is freedom of religion. Church and state separate. The Bible tells me that this will cease to exist. That they will make an image to the first beast. Church and state will come together and they will enforce their dictates. That's what the Bible says. It sounds impossible. Remember this speech. In the book Tragedy and Hope, which is uh, a rather interesting one, uh, Carol Quigley, who was... Bill Clinton's mentor, and Carol Quigley, by the way, is, was a professor at Georgetown University, the Jesuit University. And by the way, historically, do you know why the Jesuits were created, why they came into existence? 
They came into existence to deal with a specific crisis of which you were a part. In fact, the crisis was Protestantism. And their aim was to destroy Protestantism. And the present Pope is a Jesuit. Now you might believe that Rome has changed and that uh, it doesn't reflect the image of the Middle Ages anymore but uh, we will have to look into that into some detail and that's why I don't want you to miss the next lectures. Now this man said something very interesting as well. He also said that the world is ruled by a very small powerful elite of which he is a member. That was a fascinating statement. The world is ruled by a very powerful elite of which he is a member? Well, what was he? He was a Jesuit. Is he trying to say that the Jesuits control what people think and do? Leave it at that. He also said, the argument of two parties, that's political parties, should represent opposed ideas and policies, one perhaps of the right and the other of the left, is a foolish idea acceptable only to doctrinate and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical, so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shifts in policy. The policies that are vital and necessary for America are no longer subject of significant disagreement, but are disputable only in details of procedure, priority, or method. So he's saying basically, that whether you vote for the party in red or the party in blue doesn't make any difference. You're wasting your time. Basically, that's what he's saying. Now, there's another component that's very interesting, and that is how to channel the mindset of people into a particular direction, that they all start thinking the same way. And this has been done politically over eons, and it works every time. And that's called the Hegelian dialectic. Hegel was a philosopher who thought these things up, or gave it a name at least. And that is what we have there in the two political parties represented there. So what is a Hegelian dialectic? It's a framework for guiding thoughts and actions into conflicts that lead to synthetic solutions which can only be introduced once those being manipulated take a side that will advance the predetermined agenda. Brilliant. Brilliant. Controlled opposition, problem, reaction, solution. That is how the Hegelian dialectic works. So let's say I wanted to change your mindset so that you would return and cling to your Christianity whether you believe it or not. Then I must create a threat which seems greater to you than clinging to your atheism or whatever. And I must herd you into this idea. I must get rid of this threat. That which I had was better than that which I have now. I'm going to think like this. That would be one way to herd people. Now, here's Obama's legacy. And uh, if you look at it, it's actually quite humorous. He's the one who says Trump is unfit to serve as president, and many are singing that tune. But uh, here you can see the American flag in tatters, Iraq disaster, the rise of ISIS, weak border security, race relations at an all-time low, the Obama-Hillary legacy, uh, all the issues of morality that seem to have gone down the tube to such an extent that chaos breaks out. Now if the chaos starts exceeding a certain boundary, then people will be herded into nets of safety. Are you with me? Now this is being done. Whether it is being done deliberately or not is neither here nor there. I believe it's being done largely deliberately, but you don't have to believe that if you don't want to. And this man said, the future must not belong to those who slander the prophet Islam. Now that scared the wits out of many people in the United States of America because they were seeing themselves already under Sharia law. 
And uh, that scares people. So herding people in a direction. And then the loss of morality in the world. The White House lit up with rainbow of the same-sex marriage ruling. It just seemed to such a large proportion of the populace that the values that they grew up with seemed to be going down the drain. And that herds people into a collective mindset. Now what does the Bible say is going to happen to the United States? Is there going to be a mindset, yes or no? Yes. What is that mindset? The mindset that there is one set of morality and that if people don't accept that morality, then they don't have a right to exist. Are we heading that way? Is there going to be a pendulum swing from absolute liberalism to absolute authoritarian conservatism? Is that possible? It seems to me mankind just doesn't have the capacity to make the pendulum stop in the middle. Once it's swung to one side and you let it go, it inevitably swings to the other side. And there are forces which will force it in that direction. Strange that at the same time while endorsing the Prophet Muhammad, he will also endorse the legacy of Pope Francis. And he will say that this is the man that we should follow. And even more fascinating that he gave him the same stature and above and above that that he gave to any incumbent president or incoming president. Because when Pope Francis visited the United States, he followed the exact same sequence as one who actually becomes a president. First went to the White House, was received with great pomp, then he went to the Capitol, spoke to both houses of the government, made a speech in which he very cleverly cited certain individuals which stood for certain ideologies, planting a seed that these ideologies should become part and parcel of any system of governance. And when that speech was over, not like a normal president, new president who will go out the bottom doors and be greeted by the populace, he went out on the balcony which means he's over and above what a president stands for and was greeted by the populace, as you can see here. So, from there, he went to the United Nations and became the first pope to speak to the world leaders at the United Nations. Now, you'll say to me, that's not true. Many popes spoke at the United Nations. True. But they never spoke to the world leaders. They only spoke to the diplomats, to the representatives. But here was the 70th anniversary and all the world leaders were there and this man proceeded from this inauguration to speak to the entire world leadership. Fascinating. We don't have time to go into that. There's another lecture on what he said and what it means. And then these two ideologies the pendulum swing from the left to the pendulum swing on the right came into conflict. And it was a bitter conflict with many, many harsh words spoken. And people chose sides. But when it came to the red meal, they were quite cheerfully sitting on either side of the representative of the Knights of Malta, the highest knight of Malta in the United States of America, the Cardinal of New York, Cardinal Dolan. And uh, he was also the man who did the prayer at the inauguration of the new president. So these are strange issues where these parties come together and talk. And they are very cheerful, but very acrimonious when it comes to talking about each other. Now just for interest's sake, not that it has any particular relevance, but just for interest's sake, as it turns out, both Trump and Hillary Clinton are related to John Gaunt, a 14th century royal. So they have 
royal lineage. Trump is related through his mother, Mary Ann McLeod, back to his 17th great-grandfather, John Beaufort, etc., etc. And the Clintons and the, all of these were all related. And if you look at the American presidential bloodlines, you'll see... Did you know that all 44 U.S. presidents have carried European royal bloodlines into office? 34 have been genetic descendants of just one person, Charlemagne, the brutal 8th century king of the Franks. Now I find that interesting, that they're all descendants of basically one man who was the first one to be crowned emperor of the Holy Roman Empire under Rome. Just an interesting fact. Could be pure coincidence. Nineteen of them directly descended from King Edward III of England. Well, just an interesting fact. Also interesting is that uh, the little cartoon, The Simpsons, predicted a President Trump presidency. Now, it's also interesting that this same little cartoon managed to predict so many other things so accurately, so many years in advance. It's almost as if they have a prophetic line. But be that as it may, I'll just show you some pictures. This, mag this little cartoon is, of course, very heavily steeped in occultism with all the Illuminati symbolism and all of this stuff in it. Let's not even go there. But uh, I find it interesting that they in the year 2000, which is 17 or 16 years before this election, showed uh, the candidate, which not only had the same clothes on and the same beads and the same colored dress, but uh, representing, of course, Hillary Clinton. And I find that rather fascinating. And they got it pretty right and accurate with Donald Trump as well, there's their cartoon of the year 2000. He's even got the same clothes on. They're pretty good, right? I think they're clairvoyants or something. Or else they know something we don't know. And uh, uh, this also. Oh no! <laughs> it couldn't be true. Surely this didn't happen to us. Well, be that as it may, I'm not interested in going into those details. Let's not be conspiratorial. Uh, which is a word that many people are very allergic to. Let's stick to the facts. Let's just look at what is happening. Five faith facts on Mike Pence, a born-again evangelical Catholic. Now, do you know what an oxymoron is? An oxymoron is a contradiction in terms. Now, if there ever was a contradiction on, in terms then it is an evangelical Catholic. It's impossible. You're either an evangelical or you're a Catholic. But you can't be an evangelical Catholic unless there has been some kind of marriage that uh, is strange, to say the least. But that is where we're heading to. That's where the Hegelian mindset has to take humanity. Because that divide between Catholicism and Protestantism has to go. And... Uh, Mike Pence, postmodern evangelical Catholic conservative. That's the running mate and the vice president. The Washington Post says, yes, Donald Trump really went to an Ivy League school. I'd like to know where was he educated. And it tells us where he was educated. And I think we can trust the Washington Post there. And it says, first he went to a private school, then he went to military school. And then he went to Fordham University, a Jesuit school. So he was trained in a Jesuit institution, which doesn't mean very much. Most people, many people are trained there. And then he went to the University of Pennsylvania. And that is also a Catholic-run institution, which is not directly Jesuit, but indirectly Jesuit. It's also interesting that his, some of his children are trained or were trained at Georgetown University, which is a Jesuit institute. So he is associated with Jesuit institutes. Now what about Mike T Pence? Mike Pence is also very much a creation of the last half century of American 
political religious life. Did you notice that? Political religious life. Something which should be totally what? Separate. Born and raised Catholic, he became a Catholic youth minister, reportedly wanted to be a priest. So this is a very serious Catholic. And then he began blending his Catholicism with evangelical Protestantism, and I made a commitment to Christ. I'm born again evangelical Catholic. Now, I'm not denying his, his credentials. I'm just saying that theologically, this is a misnomer. But uh, let's look at the other side. His counterpart was Tim Kaine. So if Hillary had come in, uh, then the vice president would have been Tim Kaine. I wonder where he was trained. Well, let's have a look. This is Harvard Divinity School. I think that's a reputable source, don't you think? What do they say? Kaine was educated at a Jesuit high school and has been influenced throughout his life by Jesuits. Often seen as progressive and open-minded in the U.S., he also has been called Pope Francis Catholic. What does it mean to be a liberal Catholic reformer? So also again, born-again evangelical Catholic when they talk about Governor Pence. So their pedigree is the same. And it's interesting that the Jesuits say that if your general has a position, you might be called upon to take an opposite position and be militant for your position against your brother Jesuit who must take another position. But in actual fact, that is the Hegelian dialectic to herd people into a collective mindset. So both of them were Jesuit trained. Pope Francis calls for unity between evangelicals, Catholic, division is the work of the devil. So isn't it perfect to have a Catholic evangelical vice president for this kind of agenda? And uh, is there Jesuit thinking in this or is there not? With all that Jesuit training and all that Jesuit influence, is there Jesuit thinking? Well, I would be surprised if there weren't. So where is this leading to? Where are we going? Here's Charisma News exclusive. Kenneth Copeland lays hands and prays over Donald Trump. This is very important. Earlier this month, we reported how Paula White set up an invitation-only meeting between Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump and evangelical pastors. That meeting happened this week, and plenty of Pentecostals were there to lay hands on the billionaire, make declaration over his life, and pray. So who was there? Paula White was there, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland were there, Franklin, Jeremiah Crouch, Rabbi Schneider, Bishop Bloomer, the whole gambit. Is Donald Trump now a born-again Christian, asks the religious news services. And the answer is, Donald Trump has described himself as a Presbyterian and a Protestant. Now isn't this perfect? You have a Catholic vice president who claims to be evangelical and you have a Protestant president. And if the two should join forces, then they would reach across the gulf and join Protestantism to Catholicism. Now the presumptive Republican presidential nominee reportedly can add born-again Christian to that list too, according to one of the members of Trump's new evangelical advisory board. So this president has an evangelical advisory board. I'd like to know who's on that board. I don't want internet, so what's your problem? Well, let's first hear what the Protestant has to say. I don't think we need to play at all, but um, what is your story? Catholics are an important part of the American story. America has been strengthened by hardworking Catholics. From New York to California, the Catholic story is truly unique, and it's a great story. From marching for civil rights to educating millions of children, serving the poor, and helping define the pro-life movement, 
clergy and lay Catholics across the country have made countless contributions to the American success and the American success story. Washington politicians have been hostile to the church. They have been hostile to Catholics. They have been hostile to the members of Catholicism. My administration will stand side by side with the American Catholics to promote the values we all share as Christians and Americans. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. We will make America great again. So here you have a Protestant Presbyterian, that's Calvinistic, President reaching out to whom? To Catholics. Okay. And now we listen to what Mike Pence has to say. Why is this thing freaking me out? Where's the mouse? Hello? I've got cats in this place. I'm going to just go out for a second and go back in. You have cats? You see, that one works now. All right, let's see this one. Greetings, I'm Governor Mike Pence. You know, it's my honor this year to serve as the Republican nominee for Vice President of the United States with my running mate, Donald Trump. I'm grateful to be able to join you, if only by videotape, but I'm not sure how they introduce me. The introduction I prefer is pretty short. I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. And really, it's as a fellow believer uh, that I'm particularly honored to be able to address you today. I know every one of us has our own story about how we came to faith. For me, I was raised in a family where faith was important. Church on Sunday, grace before dinner. But my faith became my own when I made a personal decision to trust Jesus Christ during the spring of my freshman year in college. That night, my heart was literally broken wide with gratitude and with joy when I came to realize that what happened on the cross, in some small measure, actually happened for me. And I know... We don't have to listen to more. I'm not doubt doubting his sincerity at all. Not at all. But what I'm saying, not a word is mentioned of Catholicism from the Catholic. He's reaching out on a Protestant basis to the electorate. And here is a unifying action which is taking place. The next step that this president took was to repeal the Johnson Amendment that muzzles pastors. So he wanted to take away the provision that no prelate or a pope may prescribe to a president how he should run the country or tell the electorate how to vote. That had to go. Isn't that the first step in bringing church and state together again? So now the restrictions are gone and the pastors can speak to their congregations and tell them how to vote, which is the exact opposite of what JFK actually stood for. Let's look at his advisory board. Michelle Backman former congresswoman, senior pastor and CEO of Christian Cultural Center, Bernard Burns, Tim Clinton, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. There they are. They're going to play a very prominent role. Kenneth and Gloria Copeland, founders of Ken and Copeland Ministries. James Dobson. I mean, this is a who's who list. Jerry Falwell, Ronnie Floyd, Jensen Frank, Jack Graham, senior pastor of such and such, Harry Jackson, you name them, they're all there. And uh, James Robinson, I mean, this is literally a list that staggers, that makes one stagger. And here you have Johnny Moore, author, president of the Kairos Company. Now's the time. Now's the time. Now's the time for what? Politico had this to say about what the president said about it. I have such tremendous respect and admiration for this group, speaking to his religious advisory group. If you go back to Babylonian times, 
the Babylonian king had the Chaldeans by, him, by his side giving him input as to how to run the country. The modern day Chaldean is the Jesuit order. And you can look at the presidents of the world and make a study of who writes their speeches. And you will find that the majority is written by Jesuits. And they have been acknowledged as such. The presidents of the United States of America have acknowledged that their Jesuit counterparts or their Jesuit advisors have played prominent roles. Even Obama acknowledged that. Isn't that incredible? And this is what he says, I have such tremendous respect and admiration for this group. And I look forward to continuing to talk about the issues important to evangelicals and to all Americans and the common sense solution I will implement when I am president. Donald Trump said of his list that included such and such and such and such. Now these very people, Kenneth Copeland, here he is over here, actually visited the Pope after a tremendous speech made by this man who is unfortunately deceased since then. He died in an accident, Tony Palmer. And they all went to the Pope to enact the reunification of the Protestant world with Catholicism in one solid unit. Pope Francis met televangelist Kenneth Copeland and James Robinson. And all of these prominent Protestants went and acknowledged that the rift that took place 500 years ago should never have taken place and that it was time for healing. Mega church pastor Jack Graham ready to champion Donald Trump after meeting with 900 evangelicals. Former Southern Baptist Convention president and mega church pastor Graham said that he is ready to champion Donald Trump so here church and state is beginning to work together. And Time magazine comes up with a caption like this. Donald Trump vowed to close the gap between church and state. Is this prophecy fulfilling before our very eyes or is it not? Is this a coming together of church and state? Is this forming an image to the first power that had such power over the state. It's interesting, in the Middle Ages when Rome ruled, it would run the Inquisition, but it would never execute anyone. It would always hand the person who was found guilty over to the state for the final execution. So this is what Time magazine says. I'm not making this up, this is just history. And if you look at what happens to religion, if you look at what's happening to Christianity, and you look at the number of people going to churches and evangelicals, know this also. It's not on this kind of a climb. It looks like, you know, things are going downhill. And then it says down here, you have a chance to do something that will be earth-shaking. He said, this is Donald Trump speaking, I literally mean it, earth-shaking. You got to get your people out to vote. Isn't that the opposite of what JFK said? When no Protestant prelate will tell the people how to vote. Here's this man saying the exact opposite. In fact, in the last uh, presidential election, one of the Catholic candidates said that what JFK had to say makes him want to throw up. There's been a mind change, obviously. And yet... The world is looking at this man so puzzled, so puzzled. I'm just an observer. I like the observing. I'm looking here and I'm looking there and I'm sitting with my little puzzle and I'm throwing everything through my filter which happens to be the Word of God. And whatever comes out the other side, after being through the filter, I'll take a good look at that. That's how I like to operate. So Der Spiegel says, Das Ende der Welt, the end of the world, wie wir sie kennen, as we know it. And they see Donald Trump coming towards this world. And uh, the world in 2017, The Economist, which is the elitist magazine 
of the financial powers of the world, they had something interesting on there as well. Now, I don't know exactly what it means, but uh, I'm arrogant enough to hazard a guess. They had this to say about his presidency. And the first one over there is they have a tower and lightning strikes the tower and it breaks apart. You see that? Now, the tower. What is breaking the tower, tower apart? It's a power from above that's breaking it apart. But what is it bringing together? On the one side over there, you have communism. On the other side over there, you have Christianity. So that's a totally secular, atheistic mindset merging with a Christian mindset. And uh, this tower uh, that seemed to have blocked the way for that has a funny little door with a note on it. Do you remember a reformer that uh, uh, knocked something against the church door, against the tower? Is it possible that it is saying, I'm, I'm just guessing, all right? I'm, I'm a guessaholic, so I'm guessing. I'm guessing that this tower, this bastion, that prevented the collective mindset was Protestantism. And Protestantism has to go so that we can get the collective mindset again. Just a thought. And uh, who's going to be the system of morality then? Who's going to dictate morality? Well, he's sitting on the throne of judgment. So obviously, if you're going to judge, you must have a system of law by which to judge. And then you have the world, and you have all the religious systems, including ancient Egyptian and Greek and uh, Roman systems, plus all the writings of the world, whether it be the Talmud, whether it be the Sanctara Vita, or whether it be the Quran, all being collected in one web. World religions coming together in a collective mindset. Fascinating. I don't know if it means that. The hermit is fascinating too, because here you have all those systems that stood for globalism, this United Nations effort of making all of humanity one big conglomerate soup, uh, being overwhelmed by a flood as this prophetic hermit stands above there. So are we going to get a new mindset in the world? Is the pendulum going to swing from this absolute liberalism that ruled over Europe, which totally obliterated Protestantism, by the way, back to this conservatism? And then you have death. Oops. Ooh, looks like a nuclear explosion over there. Is this man making strange noises in the United States about using nuclear weapons? Uh, did he say that certain nations, if they continue to do what they do, will cease to exist? Did he do things like that? Just, just asking. Is it possible that under his presidency there could be some conflagrations? And then there's the magician who's using 3D technology, uh, virtual reality. Are they going to work on your mind with virtual reality? And then the Wheel of Fortune. I found this one fascinating because it has uh, the Wheel of Fortune and it has the flags there of Germany. And I think that's poor old Angela Merkel hanging on there for dear life. And then you have the Dutch election and you have the French election. Are they saying that there will be a shift in thinking from one pendulum to another? And then there are the stars, whatever that means, I have no idea, but they will know. A comet is a sign of ominous change. Nevertheless, is there going to be a new globalization? Are we going to change our minds? Obama and Merkel stand for the old system. Globalization is here to stay. We're not going to change our collective mindset. President Barack Obama and German Chancellor Angela Merkel held a joint press conference and penned an article Thursday and both stressed that globalization is here to stay. Today we find ourselves at a crossroad. The future is upon us. We will never return to pre-globalization economy. 
as Germans and Americans, we must seize the opportunity to shape globalization based on our values and our ideas. Obama and Merkel wrote in the article published in the German newspaper Handelsblatt, we're going to cling to the old system. We're not going to let it go. Go away. And then the patriot versus globalist, EU unraveling. Emboldened by Brexit and Trump's victory, many French voters believe for the first time they can change things. And then there was this Marine Le Pen said out, laid out the obvious, well, she didn't win. But there was a massive swing to the right, wasn't there? There was a massive swing to the right. After Clinton, Trump's real enemy is globalism, says Washington Post. No candidate in the election cycle had made such a direct nationalist clarion call by denouncing the false song of globalism. Trump threw down the gauntlet. Here was the right-wing sovereignist championing America first. His opponent, Hillary Clinton, the globalist. Are we going to change from the one to the other? Brexit. Rejecting globalism. So here comes a whole nation and exits this global mindset of all together, all together we are one. And out they go. Now, just for interest's sake, I find it rather fascinating that Washington, D.C., which led out with this issue with Donald Trump, and the city of London, and the Vatican, are all sovereign states. Absolute sovereign states. They are independent nations within a system. Your cat has eaten my mouse. Okay, let's see if we can go up. No, I'm going to go out and back in again, if you don't mind. Sorry. There we go. Right, working again. All right, so the city of London is actually, it's the capital, but it's also a sovereign state. If you take the Vatican, this is the territorial integrity of Vatican as a physical state. And it has its own constitution, and it has its own flag. It's an independent state. Then you have the city of London, where the business district is an independent sovereign state, with its own flag, its own coat of arms, and its own laws, and its own elections. The mayor of London is the one who heads this state. He happens to be a Muslim at the moment, which is rather interesting. And then you have the District of Columbia within Washington, which is also an independent sovereign state. By the way, the territory was owned once by the Jesuits. So that's just another strange coincidence. And uh, the obelisk stands there on the center. All three of those states actually have the obelisk in them. And it has its own flag and its own constitution. So the Foreign Affairs magazine, which is a very prominent magazine, says, end of globalism. When it rains its pause as the Great Recession, Eurozone crisis, stalled trade deals, increased conflict between Russia and the West, electoral revolts against European political elites, and finally Brexit followed, the 2008 financial meltdown, it seemed clear that globalism was running out of steam. When Donald Trump took out on, looks out on the world, he sees a landscape of potential threats to the United States and its values. Freedom of religion is a sacred right, but also a right under threat all around us. The president said at the national prayer breakfast on Thursday, and you should have watched those. They were fascinating, those prayer breakfasts. How powerfully they preached and mentioned the name of Jesus Christ, even in the presence of all those other religions. They were making a point. That which had been forbidden in the past was now becoming the norm. The world is under serious, serious threat in so many different ways, he went on. But we're going to straighten it out. That's what I do. I fix things. I wonder what he's going to fix. 
Here's another one. Why Donald Trump appeals to evangelicals? Why are they looking at him? Because here's a man who says, I will give you authority again. I will give you power again. He took the evangelicals, he made them look outside the window, and he said, look at those people walking down over there on the streets. They have more power than you. That's wrong. You should have more power than them. This is fascinating how this president works. The Christian century. I found this article rather fascinating. The rise and fall and rise of Christian nationalism. Just look at that title. The rise and fall and rise of Christian nationalism. Did the 2016 election pretend the rise of Christian nationalism? Only two years ago, the percentage of Americans who identified being a Christian with being an American had dropped precipitously from its post-September 11 hike. Just one-third of Americans in 2014 said being a Christian was very important to being a true American. That was down from nearly half of Americans who felt that way in 2004. Are we going back? Are we going back to church and state? Well, Time magazine says Donald Trump and the new dawn of tyranny. I found this fascinating. Because my scripture, my filter, when I throw this information in, and there I read in my scripture that he forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, to follow these dictates, then surely that must be authoritarian like it was in the Middle Ages. Surely there must be an authoritarian side to this. And Time magazine picks it up. The Founding Fathers designed the Constitution to prevent some Americans from exercising tyranny. Alert to the classical examples, they knew the decline of the ancient Greek and Rome into oligarchy, an empire that established the rule of law, checks and balances, etc., etc. And then it says here at the bottom, It is in this light that we should consider President Donald Trump and his closest advisors and spokespeople. Right-wing authoritarians today use the threat or the reality of terrorism to seek and hold power. Use the threat of terrorism. So in other words, you are herding people into a collective mindset. Make the fear of this solidarity less than the fear of the outside terrorism. We need to protect ourselves against these things. Robert Reich is a very prominent man. I'll show you who he is in a moment. Gave 15 warning signs of an impending Trump tyranny. And then he lists them. We don't have to go into it. As tyrants take control of democracies, they typically exaggerate their mandate to govern, claiming, for example, that they won an election by a landslide. All right, repeatedly they claim massive voter fraud. They call anyone who opposes them enemies. They call them deceitful and scum. Few of any press conference, unfiltered statement, big lies, immigrants, violence. They limit civil liberties, mass deportation, registries, unions, etc., etc., etc. Now, who's Robert Reich that we should even listen to him? Well, Robert Reich, one of the nation's leading experts on work and economy, is Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy of the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley. He had several, he had served in three national administrations, most recently as Secretary of Labor under President Bill Clinton, and Time Magazine has named him one of the ten most effective cabinet secretaries of the last century. So he's not the pumpkin. And he's telling us, we are heading for authoritarianism. Does my Bible say, say the same thing, yes or no? Yes. I'm not knocking anyone. I'm just observing. Popular 20th century journal, journalist Pierre van Parsen wrote this about Catholicism's nature. For today, Rome considers the fascist regime 
the nearest to its dogmas and interests. We have not merely the Reverend Jesuit Father Cochlan praising Mussolini's Italy as a Christian democracy, but Civilta Cattolica, house organ of the Jesuits, says quite frankly, quote, fascism is the regime that corresponds most closely to the concepts of the Church of Rome. Now please, you must not misunderstand. When you hear the word fascism, what comes into your mind? Does Adolf Hitler come to your mind? Fascist regime? Do you think of... Do you think of that? Well, that's, a, that's just a fringe of fascism. Fascism is, quote, government and industry in partnership for community. Are you with me? Government and industry in partnership for community. That's the definition of fascism. Now what does that mean? That means that when the government and the industry go into partnership, then for the sake of the community, then you have a fascist regime. Now after the financial collapse that happened in the world, what did the governments do? Did they give a loan to industry or did they bail out industry? What did they do? They bailed them out. Does industry have to pay that back? No, they don't. They don't have to pay it back. In other words, government and industry went into what? Partnership. Why? So that you wouldn't have to suffer. Apparently for the community. So since the financial collapse, the whole world really has a fascist regime. There's nothing strange about that. And Donald Trump can make laws and say, this company, you will not export your business to Mexico or anyone else. You will do it right here in the United States because I say so. Is government and industry in partnership for the sake of the community? Yes or no? It's actually fascism. And it's not surprising that he speaks here between the two fasci, which are hanging over there, which are a symbol of America. I wonder whether that was planned. All right. Is it only the United States that is experiencing this pendulum swing? Well, the answer is no. Italy rejects EU globalism. The Italian people, by a vote of nearly 60%, rejected the globalist designs of the European Union. Whoa, what's happening here? French politics moved heavily to the right. They didn't quite win, but uh, the game's not over yet. All right, so France started moving towards the right. Austria, October 16. Austria turns sharply to the right in an election shaped by immigration. So the fear of immigrants, the fear of losing your identity in a nation, is it driving them into some kind of collective mindset, yes or no? Now, does religion play a part in this? We don't have to go into all the details. Welcome to the post-liberal world. The Week, I mean, this is a prominent magazine, October 17, 2017. The presidency of Donald Trump is an American phenomenon. But it's not just an American phenomenon. It's not just an American phenomenon. It makes sense to see the rise of a right-wing cultural populist with an authoritarian instinct as an outgrowth of the American trends. Is America leading the way in the swing? Yes or no? Yes, you can mock Donald Trump as much as you like. That's where the ideology is going. Not because I'm a genius, but because the Bible says so. That's why. Welcome to the post-liberal world. Hungary and Poland are already governed by anti-liberal populists, as are Slovakia, Macedonia, Croatia, Serbia, Greece. Croatia has introduced Sunday laws, by the way. In last month's election in Germany, a far-right populist party alternative to Germany managed a stunning third place. 
showing with a 12.6% of the vote, marking the first time since the end of World War II that such a party has won seats in the legislature. Is the world moving in a direction, yes or no? This pendulum is swinging. And I want to warn the world as to where this is going to go to. I'm not a globalist. And I'm not a non-globalist. I am a theocracist. Euronews. Concerned but not afraid. Austria's Muslims react to the rise of the right. And look at the slogan that was in those elections. This is a Christian country. If you go to Turkey or Saudi Arabia and start to discredit Islam, the reaction will be the same. David, student who flew to Austria from Chechnya. So the religious component is coupled to the political agenda. Trump puts faith in religious right. Now this is interesting. This is CNN politics. I pledge that in a Trump administration, our nation's religious heritage would be cherished, protected, and defended like you have never seen before. Quote. President Donald Trump said on Friday at the Values Voter Summit meeting on Washington, that's what happened. We are stopping cold attacks on the Judeo-Christian values. Bureaucrats think they can run your lives? overrule your values, meddle in your faith, tell you how to live, what to say, how to pray. He had vowed to enhance religious interests. Here we have a president who is willing to fulfill prophecy. The world is ready to implement that which Rome claims is its mark of authority. European Day for a work-free Sunday, call for action. These are the Europeans. The Lord's Day Alliance. This is the United States of America. The Lord's Day Alliance, found, founded by six major Protestant denominations in 1888. I find that date very interesting. Spent a century fighting to force industrialists to give workers time to attend religious services and later, etc., etc. So the, the religious debate is interesting. But what is more fascinating is this one. The Lord's Day Alliance... Sunday as a what? A mark of Christian unity. Do they want to join everyone together again? The Pittsburgh Post Gazette talked about Sunday traditions. And it says there's no argument or question that our country was founded on Christian values that have eroded over the years. And then they bewail the fading away after a century of worship. We want to go back to the old days. And then it says, religion is good for families and kids. Our Congress should revisit in our candidates for president should consider advocating the restoration of Sunday. Is there a movement in Europe and the United States for the reinstating of Sunday and Christian values? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Americans deserve a day of rest, a day to be with the families, attend church, interact with people, etc., etc. We have made a truly negative rat race. We want to go back to the old systems. In 2016, one million Christians were to come together in the National Mall. And it's interesting that they chose the National Mall because that's the independent sovereign state within the United States of America. That is the hub of power. That's where Washington controls. Together is a modern-day evangelical revival complete with TED Talks, hip-hop, no politics, etc. And then in the rest of the religious sphere, they are also working at this union to get all the religious systems on board. Mr. Trump views Prince Mohammed as a crucial ally in his efforts to cement a Sunni Muslim alliance in the Persian Gulf. The prince, who also serves as the Saudi defense minister, favors, favors a confrontational line towards Iran, which dovetails with Trump's administration. Did Donald Trump turn hard 
on Iran, yes or no? Okay. What I'm seeing is an agenda. I'm forgetting the rhetoric. There's a game behind all of this. The game is simply this. All forms of extremism must go. And extremism is identified as making your own choices. You must make the choices that are dictated by the establishment. Then you are fine. If you do not make that choice, we will obliterate you. Is that the message that's coming across, yes or no? Now, doesn't the Bible say that? That how many nations will follow? What was that funny little word with three letters? All the nations will follow. This is just prof prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes. And of course, you have to have a system where you control everything. If you want to have a controlling system, you need to have eyes everywhere. If you go back in history, Herod the Great had the greatest secret police that you can imagine. You whispered, they heard it. Today we have the same kind of control. Advanced technology has been used to operate the center, which is based on three pillars, ideological, digital, informational. The center monitors and analyzes any extremist content as it detects several languages and dialects that are mostly common in addressing these ideologies. And here they're all standing with their hands on this globe. From left, President so-and-so and King Salman and all of these, they're going to monitor what everybody says. There's a system called Echelon, which monitors every single person on this planet. When you use your cell phone, when you use your computer, you are being monitored as to what you are saying. And nobody, but nobody, is exempt. Question. Was the German Chancellor monitored and all her conversations monitored that she had in her computer and other media connections? Yes or no? Yes. What did the German parliament say when they found that out, that America was monitoring them? They said, America, you will not do this. This is terrible. You remember that? What did the Americans say? Oh, we're sorry. What did they say? They said, shut up. We will monitor you when we want to, and you will keep quiet. And what did the Germans say? Okay. Okay. That's what they said. Just read your news. Everybody's being monitored. Mail Online, fundamentalism is a disease of all religions, Pope says. It is not just Islam that has extremist factions. Pope Francis today said fundamentalism is not just an Islamic problem. The Roman Catholic Church leader said the disease exists in all religions. This is interesting. Pope condemns all fundamentalism. God cannot be used to justify any form of fundamentalism. Hmm. No fundamentalism. What does that mean? What is fundamentalism? Pope condemns religious fundamentalism. He says, quote, A fundamentalist group, even if it kills no one, even if it strikes no one, is violent. The mental structure of fundamentalism is violence in the name of God. I would love to know their definition of fundamentalism. Do they conform, this president and his family, to the norms and standards of all predecessors when it comes to visiting a pope? Yes or no? Why are they all dressed in black like this? If I ever was invited to visit the pope, I'll make sure I get a pink suit. I don't think I ever will be invited, but that doesn't matter. There is this hierarchy. Even the Queen of England has to go in black, the color of the subservience to the spiritual sword, which is higher than the secular sword. Now, I find this rather interesting. When terrorism creates this mindset of fear, 
then you can introduce legislations which are useful. Theresa May, I'll rip up human rights laws that impede new terror legislation. And it's interesting that she said this after an, a, a Christian maniac did something to the populace. Not the Muslims. That's when she said this. I'll rip up human rights laws that impede new terror legislation. The Sun, May's hate squad, Theresa May will appoint anti-extremism chief to crack down on terror and root out radical hate mongers. Now this is interesting because the Bible says that if you do not obey the system, you will be what? Killed. But the law prohibits that. Because human rights gives you dignity. There should be no death sentence. But if you are a religious extremist, according to this mindset, where then is your so-called human right to life? Gone? So is it possible to envisage a world where anyone who doesn't go along with the collective religious political mindset could be eradicated without recourse to human rights, yes or no? Does the Bible say it will happen? It's happening in front of our eyes. All I want to say to you is, it's happening. The Bible is amazing, but it gets better. Donald Trump, I want to give power back to the church. You can't get more blatant than that. This is unbelievable. Trump says the federal government should never have done that. They've taken a lot of power away from the church. I want to give back power to the church. Christianity is really being chopped. Little by little it's being taken away. I want pastors and ministers to be able to get up and speak on behalf of Christianity. And they're afraid to do it right now because they don't want to lose their tax-exempt status. We will take care of that. Now he's talking on behalf of the Ten Horns. The Ten Horns are the Judeo-Christian culture emanating from the ten states of Europe that have populated not only the United States but Southern Africa and Australia and New Zealand and all the places where they wield their influence. And through the Commonwealth, Britain still controls more than you would actually believe. Even the... The Queen still controls Canada. She's on every stamp and even on their coins. So what does this mean? And now we're getting to the crux of the matter. They have to unite Protestantism and Catholicism because there must be a collective mindset. That's point number one. The morality which must be embraced must be a morality which satisfies the first beast. Because it's on behalf of Catholicism that this power will operate. Kairos, 2017. So the world will know him. A massive rally is going to take place in the United States of America in four days' time. On the 24th of October. It has to be before the 31st. Everything has to be done. Unity and Revival Conference 2017, celebrating a year of destiny. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Honoring the significance of 2017 for the church internationally. 40-year anniversary of the Ecumenical Charismatic Conference in Kansas City. 500 years anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. 50-year anniversary of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. 50-year anniversary of the Messianic Movement, which joined Judea culture with Christian culture. All these jubilees, they love jubilees. I love prophecy. They love jubilees. Discussion. In October 2017, this will be an historic conference with leaders from Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox churches. This year is a year of destiny. We believe that God is calling his people to unity in Christ as Jesus prayed in John 17 so the world would believe that God sent his Son. This unity is not about doctrines. 
Please note. But on spiritual unity, recognizing the contributions of each diverse group, the hope of which can bring healing and revival to the nation. Where is United States taking us? What will they do? Significance, pivotal anniversary of the major events in the church, the charismatic renewal reformation, the messianic Jewish movement, diversity, we want to be one in diversity, connections, Kansas City 2017, build bridges, interdenominational bridges. I want you to listen to Kenneth Copeland's crowd and see where this is heading. Let's tell the other people of, about yourself and, and then tell about the meeting that, that sure. we're having, please. Well, I'm a pastor, uh, one of John Arnott's pastors in Toronto, Canada. I work together with uh, Mateo. We've been working together. We've had a heart-to-heart -heart connection years ago. We travel the world. Catholic and, and Protestant. We bring reconciliation and unifying the body of Christ to work and bring revival, really, to see evangelism. Because that's what the Amen. Word of God says. It's that, Amen. you know, in John 13, it says, How will the world know? Being his disciples and having love for one another, the world will know, right. won't Amen. they? Well, anyways, uh, we want to talk to you about this event that culminates in so many wonderful things. 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, the 50th of you, the 67th. A jubilee year of Jerusalem. Really. Yes, amen. It's 150 for Canada. It means so much culminates next year, and it's the 40th anniversary of the 77th of, uh, 1977 event in Kansas City where denominations came together in Arrowhead Stadium. 60,000, you were there. Anyone else here that was there in that meeting? Yeah, yeah, praise God. Oh, yeah, Terry, I remember you being there. What a, what a time that was. So we're going oh. back to the October 24th to the 26th this year. You're the keynote speaker, Kenneth. Yes. And we've got leaders from around the world coming, and especially in America, just coming to Take this nation for the Lord, really. Amen. That's the heart of it. Ron, yeah, tell the people about yourself. and, and, and uh, Listen we'll... carefully. I'm, I'm a, a non-denominational guy from Dallas. I'm really a businessman, and they just kind of let me up here to carry the bags. But I'm happy to be here, believe you <laughs> me. This is great. And, and uh, I write little weird books and things. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to say I'm the only American of these guys, okay? Now, I listened this morning as we talked about racial reconciliation and the great <clears throat> divides in this country. And Lou Engel said it best. He said, a divided church cannot heal a divided nation. Oh, divided church cannot heal a divided nation. We must come together if we're to save this nation. And if we come together, then revival can break out and things will change forever. I believe. Praise God. Amen. 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 A divided church cannot save a divided nation. That means Catholicism and Protestantism has to fuse. Now, it gets even more fascinating. Kenneth Copeland made the following speech. Bear with me. I remember how important that meeting was that we were talking about earlier. And, and that there were, I'm telling you, there were people there from all over the world, and it's going to be that way this time. The difference is in the statement that I just read earlier. That church demon has fallen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. My question is, which church demon has fallen? Shall we listen to what he says about what he read and what the statement was? Let's see. I think it's this one. Please put this date on your calendar. That's the 24th. This year, yes, October the 24th through the 26th in Kansas City. Hallelujah. The most 
important event. that has to do with the outpouring and this, this, this mighty thing that has been, has been loosed in the kingdom of God in the earth. The most important thing that has happened in the body of Christ happened Some years ago, the biggest church split in history. Amen. When, when the Catholic Church split. You know the story. The beginning of the protesting church. Now, really, now you really stop thinking about it. But among, them, among the people of love, we're called protesters. We've been protesting for 500 years, baby. Yeah. It's been 500 years ago. Now that brother, now hey, that's a church split, brother. I mean, that's the church split of all church splits. I, really. Now, <laughs> October the 31st, 1999, representatives of the Catholic and the Lutheran churches gathered in Augsburg, Germany and signed a joint declaration on the subject of justification. And so 500 years of arguments, misunderstandings, and sometimes wars began to give way to reconciliation and recognition of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as placed within the body of Christ. It ended. And all of the, <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't take the time to, to go into it, but, well, let me just read you, let me, let, let me just read you the, the main article out of this. Together, we confess. Are you listening now? Yeah. By grace alone, in faith, in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good and His works. Is that all I'm going to get out of that? <laughs> Together we confess. I am reading to you current Catholic doctrine. Am I right, Mateo? Am I right, Bruno? Am I right, Ron? This is current. This, this, hey. This has been signed into Catholic doctrine. Together we confess by grace alone in faith in Christ's saving work and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to do good works. Uh, <clears throat> mm. 
Mark, you see any way to improve it? <laughs> I can't think of that. Huh? Huh? The only thing I'd put in there, please don't make me wear that robe. <laughs> no, that. <laughs> no. Come on, man. Yeah. This is coming together in the unity of the faith. And this is just not between the Catholics and the Protestants. Here's what, here, here's what took place all those years. When that church split took place, and that spirit of division sat down on his throne, we've been dividing ever since. That's the root of it, right there. But the day that they put their signatures on this and they prayed over this and they laid hands on this and, and worship God over this. Listen, this thing took five years to put together. There was a lot of prayer and there was a, a, a lot of crying out to God in this until it came down to that one statement. Amen. Amen. And it opened the door. I mean, the spirit of God got that spirit of division by the throat and just slammed him down under our feet, praise God. And now it's up to us to keep him there. So that spirit of division was slammed down and grabbed by the throat. And in the previous statement, he said that spirit was demonic. So the Protestant movement according to this Protestant so-called, was demonic. And he read the Joint Declaration on Justification. And when you hear it, it sounds just too marvelous that Rome should adopt something like that. And most Christians in the world will say, I can go along with that, where do I sign? And they don't realize that when they sign it, they are signing their death warrant because they haven't read it carefully and they don't understand the difference between Protestantism and Catholicism because we've lost it in our secular world. And we need to discuss it in detail because the world is on the brink of a precipice. And tomorrow night, we are going to talk about that statement and we're going to take it apart and we're going to look what's wrong with it and why it's wrong and why we need to take a stand. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. In other words, if anybody speaks against this unity that is coming about, that person will be mocked as an enemy of society. I'm sticking my neck out for you. I know what this means. I'm not doing this without thinking about it. This is a serious issue. I want to warn you. I want to warn the people of this country. I want to warn the Protestant world as to what is coming. But you need to understand why. It mustn't just be some euphoric idea that you have, some inner trembling in your stomach. It must be based solidly on the principles of the Word of God. And if it's based on that, then you can stand like the Protestants stood and were willing to die for it because they had a foundation that couldn't be moved. It wasn't on sand. This is going to happen. It's happening in front of our very eyes. Trump during photo shoot talks of calm before the storm. I wonder what he's talking about. What storm, Mr. President, one reporter shouted. ISIS, North Korea, Iran? You'll find out, the president said. He also praised those assembled for the photo, saying, we have the world's great military people in this room. I will tell you that. There's a storm coming. Do you think people will be forced to listen to a collective mindset? You're either with us or you're against us. Revelation 17, 12, and the ten horns, we know who those are, which thou sawest are ten kings, 
which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. There's going to be a union between the states of Europe and its satellite states with the papacy. It's going to happen. These have one mind, collective mindset, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Who's going to dictate morality according to this verse? Catholicism is. Catholicism is. These shall make war with the Lamb. How do you make war with the Lamb? Can you shoot him out of the sky with a pea shooter or an atomic bomb? Can you kill God? Can you do that? How do you make war with the Lamb? You make war with the Lamb by attacking his integrity, his doctrines, and his people. That's how you make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. My prayer is that you will be called and chosen and faithful. But you need to know why. And therefore, even if you are disturbed by tonight's lecture, don't miss tomorrow's lecture. Because tomorrow's lecture is not based on in political intrigue. It's based on the Word of God and what the issue is and why there is a war coming and why we need to be forewarned and why we need to stand like your kings used to stand in your history, willing to die for a cause. May God grant you mercy. May God grant you wisdom. May God grant you understanding. May God grant you fortitude. May God grant you courage as we face the times that are ahead of us. It's not long now. I believe we're going home soon. Thank you.